Hi guys, it's Geekonomics here, and today I'm going to run through the answers and what I would expect you and anticipate you to have in your answers for the practice paper for the A2 paper, that's F585, The Global Economy. And you recall that I, um, I put a video up on this uh, just before the Easter holiday, and I put a little Dropbox link into a paper, and I know that some of you have been working on this. So today I'm going to run through the answers to 1A, 1B, 1C and 1D and then uh, in the uh, next couple of days I'll upload a video which has the answers to the rest of the questions. So let me just put on the, uh, oh wait, on the board here, let me just show you the paper I'm talking about uh, and obviously uh, we can get started straight away. So... This is the paper that I'm talking about, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm going to go through 1A, 1B, 1C and 1D. And obviously, when we're looking at this, we're looking at it in relation to this particular extract material. Okay, so let me just bring that back. Okay. Uh, sorry, I have to keep uh, running across here, ladies and gentlemen. This board is not working properly at the moment. So. Question 1A was uh, quite simple and straightforward to start off with. So question 1A, define capital goods. So capital refers to goods that are used to produce other goods and services. And you could give uh, one or two examples. It's only a two by two question, this one, so very straightforward. Define comparative advantage. Country is said to have a comparative advantage in the production of that good or service that it can produce at the lowest possible opportunity cost. Remember, it's all about opportunity cost ratios for comparative advantage. And then we get into the first of the, uh, what I would refer to as the more extended writing questions. Note that it's an analysed question. So this is not a question which requires a, a two-sided argument. This is just a straightforward analysis type of thing. So analyse two possible reasons why changes in the effective exchange rate fail to have and quote unquote, this is lifted straight from your pre-release material, fail to have their expected impact on the US current account deficit. So, how would we go about answering this question? Point number one, define the effective exchange rate and define the, expect, the effective exchange rate index. So make sure that you comment that this is not simply the US dollar measured against the, the uh, Chinese Yuan. This is the effective exchange rate index, so it's a weighted index, and it's weighted in terms of the countries that the US would trade most predominantly with, and they would have the greatest weights attached to them. And then also define what we mean by the current account deficit. Uh, remember that when we're talking about current account deficit, it's imports greater than exports, but the key thing here is that it's the value of imports greater than the value of exports. You're obviously shown that in your uh, pre-release material and you've got the data and you're uh, given the chart to show that, the, the US deficit compared to the Chinese surplus. Then I think you should explain that a significant depreciation of the EER, the effective exchange rate, would be expected to significantly narrow the size of the current account deficit. Um, and of course, we know the reasons why that is. Uh, when the exchange rate depreciates, we would anticipate that the price of exports will fall, and cateris paribus, all other things remaining equal, the demand for exports should rise. And the flip side of the same coin, the price of imports will rise, the demand for imports will fall, and so we should end up with, if not necessarily a, um, a surplus of current account deficit, we should certainly see a significant narrowing of the size of that deficit. Then I think you should, as I've said here, refer to the data. You're given these charts, you're given these graphs, make use of them, reference them. So. I've said here that the effective exchange rate over the time period that you're shown in the chart, if I had the pen working here, I'd bring this chart up again, but you can look at it yourselves, it depreciates by 4.8%. So it's depreciated from an index number at the start of the time period of 104 to an index number of 99. So that's 4.8%. The US current account 
deficit narrows by almost 50%. So in the other chart that you've shown on that particular extract, you can see that the size of the US current account deficit goes from around about 725 US dollars deficit to 400 billion. So um, it's around, it's not 50%, but it's close to 50% reduction. And then you're asked, you know, to analyze the reasons why, uh, two possible reasons. I've given a number of reasons here, and, you know, analyze two of them as, as you wish and as you're most comfortable with. So it could be to do with the price elasticity of demand for imports and exports, uh, Marshall Lerner condition and the J curve. That's a great one to do because there's so much to get stuck into there. You really get your teeth into that one. Remember that uh, Marshall Lerner would suggest and say that the current account deficit will only really recover and move towards a surplus if the price elasticity of demand for imports and exports is, if the sum total is greater than one obviously being elastic because you want very uh, significant changes in quantities of both X and M, exports and imports, in order to narrow the size of this deficit. Uh, you could by all means draw the J curve um, and explain that as well, but obviously it's only a six mark question so you don't want to go into too much depth on these. You could talk about the quality of the products coming out of the US. They might be cheaper but the quality might not be up to scratch. Now, uh, when you compare that with China, you'd have to say that's probably not the case. You could talk about the fact that just because uh, the export prices fall, well, we've, we're assuming Cateris Paribus, all other things remaining equal. Well, if, if at the same time as export prices are falling, incomes abroad, maybe due to global recession, whatever it may be, if incomes abroad are falling, so people may not still be able to buy and afford these cheaper exports. And then you could talk about ex transport costs. So export prices falling, but of course you've got to get them from America to wherever. And as a consequence of that, they, that requires transport, which may be costly, which may increase the sum total of the price of that export, making it relatively still uncompetitive. So there are all sorts of things there. You only asked to explain two. I think if you did this one, you know, with diagrams and so on, and maybe one of the other ones, which you could do in a little bit uh, more uh, brevity, uh, that would be uh, two good ones to do. So that would be it for C. And then D with reference to extract three, comment on the importance of the terms of trade for Zambia's economic performance. So again, I always like to structure these in the same sort of way. So again, define the TOT, the terms of trade, and give the terms of trade equation, index of export prices over index of import prices times 100. Again, reference your data, so we can see from the data that the terms of trade has improved from an index of 95 approximately in 2001 to 185 in 2012 and work that out, that's a 94.7% improvement. Then you'd want to say, well, what does this improvement mean in terms of Zambia's ability to import capital goods for development? Well, of course, it means that for every unit of export it sells, it's able to bring in more units of imports, therefore more capital goods for its development. So in terms of its economic performance, where we're talking about... Um, we're talking about employment, inflation, trade, etc. This is all beneficial. You could also uh, explain the impact on export revenues because obviously if the price is going up the de and the demand is still there and copper accounts for three quarters of Zambia's export revenues, then obviously that is going to be highly beneficial in terms of the amount of the income stream flowing into the economy. And you, you, to sort of carry that on, what does that mean for the foreign exchange constraint? Well, again, it means that more foreign exchange is coming into the economy, and again, that further develops Zambia's ability to bring goods and services in from abroad. I think it's always good on a, an analysis question and a comment question to include a diagram, because as soon as you start explaining the diagram, you're analyzing. So I would always recommend a diagram here and an explanation. I think on your diagram here, you should be shifting AD and AS to the right, which, as you'll know, is referred to as sustainable economic growth. 
And when you're explaining your diagram, and explaining why AD and AS are shifting to the right, obviously because you're bringing more capital goods in, you've got more investment. So not only is that shifting AD, but you've got the double whammy effect there that it's increasing your productive capacity. So AS shifts right also. And you know, feel free, obviously, you could throw in um, reference to the multiplier and the accelerator theories there as well. And then link this explanation into figure 3.1 if you want where it talks about life expectancy, schooling, and HDI. Um, obviously, when the economy is growing in this way, there'll be more funds which can then be channeled into these areas and improve all of these areas too. Again, I wouldn't sort of go overboard on that. Maybe a sentence on it would be fine. Then into the comments. So remember, the comment question re requires a two-sided discussion. So we, this is our analysis of what ought to happen. And then here's our comments to say, well, it's all very well this economic theory malarkey, but here's a few reasons why what you said here in points 1 to 7 might not actually happen. So you could talk about the fact that Zambia has all its eggs in one basket, uh, which we would refer to as the Dutch disease. If you Google that and find out, do a little bit of research on it, don't want to say anything more on that at this point. You could talk about the Preby Singer hypothesis. You'll notice in your OCR textbook there are various uh, theories and hypotheses in there with regard to Harrod Domar, Preby Singer, Thurlwall's Law, etc., etc. And so you might want to reference Preby Singer here because Preby Singer, of course, states that de uh, developing nations such as Zambia, which are predominantly um, specialising in primary commodities, will see that over time their terms of trade has a tendency to deteriorate and decline. So what we've said here is counter to what Preby Singer says, but actually, if you follow that on with point number three, global demand at the moment is now falling, global demand for copper that is, and as a consequence the price of uh, copper is falling, and that will lead to a deterioration in um, Zambia's terms of trade, which for an economy which does have most of its eggs all in the one basket, that is very difficult when you've no uh, diversification in that respect. You could talk about and reference YED, so I mean income elasticity of demand. And notice here, ladies and gentlemen, the way we're throwing in micro and macro uh, all together because we can do this in the synoptic unit. And by the time you've reached the end of your A2, you're now able and competent enough to sort of juggle the micro, the macro, to just bring it all seamlessly together. So income elasticity of demand, you'll know that the income elasticity of demand for your, um, for your primary commodities tends to be very elastic and as a consequence of that, as global incomes are rising, the demand for these primary commodities will not be rising as fast. Point number five, uh, your extract material or materials talks about the fact that there are high rates of inflation in Zambia. So it could be the fact that inflation is uh, artificially pushing up the price of the exports going out of Zambia and so that could obviously have a detrimental impact on demand uh, and therefore you wouldn't get the revenue streams coming in, you wouldn't therefore be able to bring the capital goods in and so on. And then finally it could also be happening because of a strengthening kwacha, the Zambian kwacha, the currency. and You'll know that the, the golden rule is that the price of the export always moves in the same direction as the currency. So if the currency is appreciating, the price Could of the export... Schweiz, sir. Please come to reception. Thank you. The price of the export will also be rising. And again, therefore it might be rising not because of demand pool factors, purely because of other factors. And again, that will be a limiting factor to how many units of the export you sell and how much money you can bring in and so on. So I think that would be um, a, nice little, uh, a nice little number of comments for uh, this particular question. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, you do on the one hand, you do on the other hand, and then you, at the end here, I haven't put it here, you know, I'll leave this up to you, you've got to do a concluding paragraph not a sort of in my opinion paragraph, it's got to be on balance, evidence suggests that and then you deliver some type of conclusion, just a sentence of conclusion to this question. 
So that's it for today and I'll bring you question two in the next couple of days and then the final essay question, hopefully all by the end of the week. So uh, keep subscribing, stay tuned and I hope your revision is...